Carl, Louisiana. I'm Chef John Foles welcoming you to this great state of ours. These beautiful plantation homes reflect the fascinating history of our culture and cuisine, and I'd like to share this story with you. Why not join me and some of my friends as we visit the plantation homes of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Louisiana Gold and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. View Carré, Zydeco, Achafalaya. In Louisiana, you'll say things you've never seen before. When Ambrose Lacombe decided to build his plantation home on the banks of the Cane River in 1832, he positioned it under a large grove of magnolia trees. Not only did the home have 28 rooms and twin galleries, but a Catholic chapel that's still in use today. He went on to build brick slave cabins, a real oddity at that time, and a mule-driven cotton gin, one of two left standing in the United States. When the Civil War General Nathaniel Banks came through after the Battle of Mansfield, he burned the home to the ground. But luckily, in 1896, the plantation was restored. I'm Chef John Foles. Welcome to Magnolia Plantation. It's extremely difficult for us today to conceive why anyone would burn such a beautiful home to the ground. However, many of our Louisiana plantation homes suffer this fate during the Civil War. Imagine spending an afternoon on this magnificent gallery. Having remained in the same family since 1832 and reconstructed by the son of the builder, most of the original furnishings are still right here in the plantation home today. Definitely the most unique room of all the 28 in the home is this little Catholic chapel added at the turn of the century. Services were held here at the plantation on a regular basis for many years. Most of the statues and artwork in the chapel are from the original Catholic church in the area demolished in the early 1900s. These black cattle sconces that you see were rescued from a trash bin by the owner's mother who happened by at the right moment. Today, Magnolia is still a working plantation and visitors will certainly enjoy walking through the barnyard and may even wish to feed an occasional chicken, goose, or guinea hen that may be roaming the property. The plantation still forms cotton and here you will see one of only two mule-driven cotton presses left standing in the United States today. The family is concerned about preservation of this very rare glimpse of early plantation life. This huge hand-carved wooden spool and cypress chute was used to compress the seeded cotton bowls into bales of cotton such as the one you're seeing here, and then it was loaded on steamboats for shipment to New Orleans. These brick slave cabins were very rare for their day since most were simply made of wood. There are six left standing from the original group, and work has been done on the roof and brick walls to help stabilize them. The National Park Service has shown interest in many sites in this region, and hopefully they will assist in preserving these unique buildings from our past. It's amazing how so many of us here in Louisiana, and I'm sure in the rest of the country, think of plantation life as existing only between Baton Rouge and New Orleans on the Mississippi River. But Magnolia is just one example of the many plantation homes that exist on the interior, and this one in North Louisiana. Uh, and you can imagine just how varied the architecture is by looking at this, not only the plantation life. You have to come and spend about 10 days traveling this state from the mouth of the river to Monroe to just get a great glimpse of what plantation life was all about in early Louisiana. Now, I have a very interesting guest that's going to be on the show today, coming into the kitchen a couple of minutes from now, and they, that's Dr. Hugh Perkins. Dr. Perkins is an academic humanist, but he also taught a lot of classes on the black experience at Louisiana State University and Southern University, and he and I are going to talk a little bit about the slave issue and why people are so, I guess, afraid to talk about slavery today, but he and I aren't, and we're going to visit about that in a couple of minutes. First, I want you to look at this cutting board of mine on the counter, though. I get letters all the time from people asking, what are all of these different woods and the stripes here? And I, 
I have to answer it for you. This is oak. This little light wood is oak. This is birch, which separates the mahogany from the oak. And this was given to me as a gift a couple of years ago. And all I have to do is take a little piece of, uh, oh, I don't know, Brillo or one of those scouring pads and scrub it every day. And it comes out really nice and smooth. And it's not only a pretty cutting board, but it's very hard. So it's perfect for chopping on. Now, what dishes uh, did they cook at Magnolia Plantation? Well, North Louisiana, a little bit more of that English territory, of course, so some of the foods tended to be a lot less spicy than here in the South. But one of the dishes that I found that was very interesting, but yet something that could be duplicated in any home, was a rolled meatloaf that's stuffed with a lot of different vegetables. And I think you can have a lot of variance in this dish as well. You can fill it with anything that you want. I want you to well, look at this bowl here with all these nice checkerboard squares on it. In the bottom of it, I have about, oh, I don't know, maybe two pounds of ground beef. And here I have about a pound of ground pork. And you've heard me say before that the important thing about ground meats is that I like to combine pork and beef because beef holds the texture and pork, of course, has all of that great flavor. So I'm going to combine these two to make just a standard meatloaf, but I'm going to flavor it in the Louisiana style. I'm going to put a couple of eggs down in here like that and just a little touch of milk to hold it all together. But then I'm going to flavor it with all of those great things that we think of as Louisiana flavorings. I'm going to put some onions in here, celery, of course, bell pepper. I'm going to put the colored bell peppers because this is going to be kind of a center of the table entree that's going to have a lot of nice uh, eye appeal to it once it comes together. You can see I'm going to put some purple cabbage, of course, garlic, a lot of that good garlic, green onions, and then a little touch of parsley. Let me just throw a couple of these in here. And again, you can see how you would be able to add any of your own spices or flavors to it. I'm going to also put some nice fresh basil. I can put a couple of leaves of basil down in here, thyme, oregano, whatever you want. I'm going to make a tomato uh, sauce to go with this. So of course, oregano or any of those great Italian uh, seasonings would go well with this dish. So once all of these things are combined, you want to kind of whip it all together. and. You have to put your hands in it sometimes but to get it really uh, well mixed. But once you get all of these things in, then, of course, season with a little salt, pepper, a little bit of that Louisiana hot sauce if you want spice. I'm going to add that to it. You can see how juicy it is. Now, this is a rolled meatloaf. So you kind of have to do it in the privacy of your kitchen, you know, because sometimes it's a little messy. And that's OK. I wanted to show you how it was done. So I'm going to do it here before your very eyes. So once I mix all of these things, now I can season a little touch of salt. Of course, the pork is going to give it really nice flavor. So you want to add just some of the spice to it, a little salt, a little pepper, and then some Louisiana hot sauce. Put a couple little sprigs in there. You could also put some Worcestershire sauce or all of those great things. Continue the, to uh, blend that in well. And basically what we're doing is just flavoring a meatloaf. You could take this now and put it into a loaf pan, bake it, and it would be absolutely perfect. But we're going to roll it. So let me bring my little pan up here. And look at this pan. I've taken just, oh, I don't know, this is about a half size sheet pan that you find in uh, bakery stores or whatever. But you can get this. It's got a, a, a nice liner on it so it won't stick. But I'm putting some wax paper to help roll the meatloaf. Now I'm going to just kind of dump all of this here. And now I want to press it into the pan. And this is when the wax paper is going to kind of help us out. So you want to kind of move it all around here. Just spread it out. And once it's uh, kind of formed in as best you can, then you want to get in it with your hands and smooth it out the rest of the way. Push it into all of those corners like this. I washed my hands a couple minutes ago. It's, they're nice and clean. Just kind of spread it out so that we can then come in and put the filling into this meatloaf. That looks really nice. See all of these great, great flavors. Look at the color down in here just from those red bell peppers and the purple cabbage. Now, once that's all in, of course, you want to get all of this mess off of your hands here. So. 
Just kind of rinse it off. The important thing again is that you just add whatever herbs and spices and flavors you like in your own home. I think that's the important thing is that you add your personal touch to a dish like this and it'll become your own. So now that that's done, I'm gonna sprinkle in my stuffings. I've got corn, I've got some poached potatoes, and I've got more of those pretty colors in here as you can see, but imagine putting squash. You can add a little squash to this. You could add some zucchini, eggplant, anything that would give this some nice color. Now to roll it, you just pick up the edges of the paper, just kind of grab it like this and turn it over. You see how that's done? And then you just kind of pull the paper back. It's so simple, it's like falling off of a log. See that? And then you can take it and season the outside of the loaf really nicely like that, and then put it into a baking dish. And I have one already done. So, let me show you what this is all about. Look at this. And look how pretty the outside of it is as all of those colors just kind of come together on top of it. Now, I'm going to add to that a prepared tomato sauce. Now, look at this. This is just, I've taken tomato sauce and right out of the can, and I've added a few little onions and celery to it, salt and pepper. Of course, remember, all of the flavor is already in the meatloaf. So you don't need too much extra flavor here, even though coming from Louisiana, I did add just a little bit. Now I'll put more of these great seasonings, a little parsley, of course, on top of it, and into about a 350 degree oven for an hour. And I'll just put this in the oven here, uncovered. Let's go ahead and put it in. Let it cook uncovered for about an hour, it'll come out just like this. Take a look at that nice meatloaf right here, all rolled with the vegetables inside. And of course, I can put just a little bit more of that purple color on top of it. Isn't that a beautiful dish from Magnolia Plantation up around Natchitoches, Louisiana? So I'll put that out of the way. The second dish that I found at Magnolia was very interesting. In fact, I personally have cooked this dish a lot of times because I like it so much. It's sort of like a quiche, but then at the same time, it makes a wonderful luncheon entree that's got a little bit more of a Louisiana flavor to it. And this is a pie. It's a tomato, basil, seafood pie. Of course, you could use chicken. You could poach some chicken to make this pie with. But look at my counter here, and I've got a, a platter that's got some andouille, which is the Louisiana sausage. You could use ham. I've got crab meat here, and again, you can use scallops or anything else you want, and shrimp. These are the white shrimp. We have two shrimp seasons every year in Louisiana. About 100 million pounds of these shrimp are harvested out of the Gulf of Mexico. One of seven species pulled out of the Gulf, and this is my favorite shrimp. Of course, two different cheeses. We have a little American, a little Swiss, and some onions, basil to go into the pie. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a prepared pie crust. You can buy them in the store. You can make them from your favorite recipe. But the important thing is that in the bottom of the pie crust, you want to paint just a little bit olive oil like I'm going to do here to start to give this crust a little flavor down in the bottom before I put in all of my nice freshly sliced tomatoes. Now, you always want to drain your tomatoes on paper towels to get all of that excess moisture out of them because they'll have a tendency to run in the pie crust becomes real moist and gooey, so you want to make sure you drain it first. And go ahead and put a couple slices of the tomato down into the bottom of the pie shell, just like this, kind of overlap them, and then sprinkle in that andouille sausage or ham, a couple little pieces of crab meat like this. Boy, I tell you, I know you're thinking to yourself how great these flavors are going to come together. Of course, some basil. I'm going to sprinkle basil down into it, and then a combination of cheeses. Use whatever cheese you want also. I, I hate to think that I have to stick to a recipe all the time. I like to just kind of experiment a little bit. Now, of course, do another layer the same way. Just come on up with another layer and continue to put those layers together until you have all of those really nice flavors to the finish. And then once you do that, you can sprinkle a little bit more cheese in here Put some of these red Bermuda onions, which is going to give it a really nice look. And of course, again, these are sweet, so as they cook, you're going to have a lot of good flavor. Finish it with a little bit crab meat, a little bit shrimp, 
put more of that in. Of course, more basil, and then a touch of that olive oil across the tomatoes, and then season it. I'm gonna put salt, pepper, I can put a little hot sauce in here, I can do whatever herbs, dried herbs and spices I want to. It's gonna be a really, really nice dish. And then I finish the top with a little Parmesan, grated fresh Parmesan and breadcrumbs. Put some seasoned Italian breadcrumbs across the top of it. It's gonna be really nice. And I wanna show you what one of these looks like. I baked these at about, oh, I guess 350 degrees again for about oh, an hour or so. And what we have is this. Take a look at that beautiful tomato basil pie that is full of all those nice crab, chunks of crab and of course shrimp. Really a beautiful dish. I'll garnish again and that is my tomato basil pie. Now, one other dish I found while I was out at Magnolia Plantation and enjoyed it sitting out in that barnyard was the Cane River Pound Cake. Take a look at that pound cake right here. There's fresh peaches uh, right in the top because Ruston, Louisiana is right next door. And in Ruston, there's a lot of peaches growing all year long. Take a look at that Louisiana cane syrup going right on top of that beautiful pound cake from Cane River. Isn't that nice? That's a great, great dish, and I love it. Okay, I promised y'all a great friend of mine coming into the kitchen, you Perkins, Dr. Perkins, who knows a lot about the black experience in Louisiana. Come on in. What's my, I got a little school hey, in your John, way there. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. How have you been? Good to see you work. <laughs> You're an absolute <laughs> artist. <laughs> You, you've painted a picture. Well, I have to tell you, my good friend Sharon Jesselshack, you know, she sits in the back of the counter and she puts all these beautiful things together. I just look you like just, I know what I'm doing. But right? look, <laughs> look how it comes out, all of the colors and all of the it, it, taste. It, 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 well, I, look, thank you so much for coming. We had a great dinner the other night, Oh, didn't we, we did, we did. We talked about everything and we just renewed all the acquaintances. It's just good to be on your show. You know, when we finished our dinner there, we mm -hmm. were talking about that crawfish oh, dip yes. that we were sitting eating at oh, the beginning yes. of the meal. And I yes. told you, not only was I going to show sure. you how to make it, I was going to show all of them how to make it. You're going to put it on the show. So you're going to help me, though. I'm going to help you. Let's I'll help you okay, <laughs> now, get in, this together. In my little, uh, uh, my little food process, I have about eight ounces of cream cheese and a little mayonnaise. I want you to dump in all those fresh. All right. Uh, that's a little basil in time. Just dump all it right. on in there. All right. You can squeeze that lemon squeeze in. Squeeze the lemon in. This is crawfish. Now, this is a mm. crawfish and cucumber dip. That sounds I pretty see. good already. I'm going to put oh, the yeah. rest in there. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm going to put in, there you go, squeeze that all in. Then, you can put are those about, cucumbers? These are cucumbers, and I've mm -hmm. got them all uh, just cut. I left nice. the peel on, too, because it's going to have a really nice look to it. And then, I can add That's some of these good flavors. Put a little pepper in there. Mm -hmm. I know. You're painting a picture, John. Hey, look. With you, food. Hey, you know, what, you know what they say about chefs? Our, our canvas is the plate, Your right? canvas <laughs> is the plate. You're okay, junior. now we're going to put this in here like this. Mm -hmm. And I can kind of zap that around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And once it all cooks, to all, all chops together, yeah. it makes a wonderful, wonderful dip. Now, what did you start with? What was the base? I put a little uh, cream cheese cream in cheese. here. And mm -hmm. I put a little bit of mayonnaise in mayonnaise. it. Yeah. You put a little lemon and herbs I in see. it. And then that crawfish, of course, hey, use shrimp. Or, or again, just stay away from the seafood and use something else. There's a lot of different uh, varieties of flavors. Yeah. Now, why don't you give me that and we'll I'll give you fill this it up. Now, look, you told me you like this stuff. I want to oh, make I sure do. you do. You oh, know? I we'll, do. We'll test some a little later. I'm going to go right. ahead and put it right put it. into this red cabbage, this mm -hmm. purple cabbage. It's pretty color, too. That crawfish gives it that it really does. nice, it nice, it, yeah. isn't that nice? The crawfish gives it that pretty mm -hmm. color right there. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. Now, we could sit here and eat every bit of it. Just yes, go ahead and put it right down there. All and, right. And have a seat. We're going to chat a little bit about okay. all the things we were chatting about the other day because we had such a... Oh, we a had a good, delightful conversation. <laughs> didn't we? We really did. So let me ask you a question. Why is it that after 100, I guess it's 130 years from the abolition of slavery in Louisiana and the South, uh -huh. America, not the South, why are people still so afraid to talk about slavery? Oh, John, it goes way back. It's a feeling of guilt, the feeling of revenge. All of these feelings come through when you talk about slavery. You, you have to realize that here was the South giving up a way of life, which it had come to, to appreciate and to like. And here's the black man wanting to forget that way of life. He never wants to have it repeated at all. Um, you're Cajun. I'm black. Uh, 
you can blend your, you can change your accent and blend into a, 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 another culture. I can't. My blackness is a fact. They can always point to me and say, this man has in his background something of slavery. It's, I, I told you the other night, it's, it, it, it's a hierarchy. The, the white man would like to always have someone beneath him. And the black man is easier to be identified, and you're the one that I'm a little better than. Well, you know, we, we looked just a minute ago. We saw six or seven brick slave cabins. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was a typical day, in your opinion, like in that slave cabin? Oh, uh, it was demoralizing. It was debasing because blacks had no life outside of this workaday sun up to sundown. You have to realize that, that, that there were so many codes and laws operating against black people. They couldn't enter into a contract, couldn't get married. They jumped over a broom couldn't buy property, couldn't carry firearms, in some places couldn't meet without a white being present. But the most devastating of those codes which existed was this, do not teach blacks how to read and write. We're still paying for that, for, for, for that denial. You see, keep them ignorant, you keep them enslaved. Oh, I think of uh, Frederick Douglass, who, whose uh, uh, slave mistress decided she was going to teach him the alphabet. And the slave master says, do not teach a slave to read and write. It would ruin the worst nigger. Don't teach him to read, because then he'd want to do other things. Frederick Douglass then became the, the, the articulate spokesman for the abolitionist movement. Uh, did any good at all, was there anything that happened in those cabins that we can say was good? Well... It would be difficult to identify. We know this. We know that there was a sort of interdependency, that because the slave, because the slave life was so circumscribed, because the plantation was self-contained, you began to depend upon each other and to try to, 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 to help each other. You yourself, John, told me the story of how you learned how to cook. This black lady who raised you, your eight brothers and sisters, and her six children, you see that dependency, that sort of honesty which took place then. That was always a sort of honesty in the South, which I didn't see any other place. If the white man disliked you, it was known. If he liked you, it was also known, and he could help you. Did the slaves have any freedoms whatsoever? If you can call it freedom, was there any rights that they had? Well, very few rights, but I think of the centrality of the church. It was the one place where slaves could give vent to their feelings, could give vent to their emotions, and the meanest of the slave owners would allow his slaves to go to church. And it was there the, slave, the church became the spiritual bank. It produced our leaders, Nat Turner, and even today most of our leaders come out of the church. It, it, it was this freedom to give, your, give vent to your expression that the church provided, which nothing else provided in, 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 in the period of slavery. Are you and I any better off because of it? Have we learned anything, I guess I should say, over the years because of slavery? Uh, we've learned maybe the most important lesson, that we're all human beings, that we have only this one planet, we must try to get along here as human beings. Uh, race is an accident of birth, John. You didn't decide to be born Cajun, and I'm deciding to be born black. This happens. Don't hold that against, I would not hold that against you, and you should hold it against me. I think maybe the one lesson we've learned is that we are all in this together, and we must respect each other this despite our differences. In my own instance, I think some changes have taken place. Well, I tell you, I think some great changes have taken We have a long way to go, but I tell you what, it starts with you and I. Yes. <laughs> great. Thank John, you so much for thanks coming Thanks for having you on my show. really appreciate it. And I enjoyed I, seeing you work. <laughs> and thank you all for coming and visit with us as we continue to cook up Morty's Great Taste of Louisiana. Now we can taste it, huh? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs>
Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Louisiana Gold and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. View Carré, Zydeco, Achafalaya. In Louisiana, you'll say things you've never seen before. Chef John Fosa's Plantation Celebrations, Recipes from Our Louisiana Mansions, is a full-color 335-page book containing food history, recipes, and over 150 photographs from these southern landmarks. For your copy, send a check or money order for $28.50 to Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Or use your credit card by calling toll-free 1-800-973-7246.